Greetings, dear ones. I'm Cryon of Magnetic Service. And the message to follow is exactly what my partner thought it would be. There is a protocol that I work with, if you can even call me and I. <laughs> and that protocol is with my partner, where he gets the opportunity to enhance a message that he hears for the first time in one place. And he would be hesitant to ever repeat a channeling. Hesitant if he heard it coming again in the way that it had been given before. Because in his mind it always has to be original. And so in order to enhance the instructions for him, we stop the recorder the first time around. And now we give the message again. And those who have heard the message that are hearing this one will recognize it. The structure is the same. The verbiage, very similar. Dear human beings, you want to singularize everything that is. You have a tendency to take that which you are in your dimensionality and place it upon God. And it's not surprising, and there's no judgment. It's all you have, and your reality is your reality. And therefore, you place upon God that which you know, not that which you don't know. But now it is up to me to give this explanation to you again about the human soul, which is not really human at all. Let me state this, that the creative source of the universe always was and always will be. That which you call the creative source, which you have labeled God, or which you have labeled spirit, is what we are talking about now. And you might say that it is comprised of pieces of all that is. And you'd be right. And even before this universe existed, it was there. It is responsible for all that exists anywhere, including the universes that existed that are before yours and coexistent with yours now that you know nothing about. This is the creative source. And that particular source that you call God has a soup of energy that is what you would best call a quantum soup. It is beyond your physics. It is beyond quantum physics. It is in a realm all by itself, which is God. It is spectacular and beautiful. And you were there. You were there because you the very core of you is part of God. I want you to really get this straight. Can you imagine being here? Literally unable to see any part of your beautiful universe, the very creation itself. To exist in front of a supernova and watch it work and explode and the light that existed from it, all knowing it was part of natural physics. Part of the creating process, the cycles of energy. There would be no harm come to you. You would be able to see and hear everything that is seeable or hearable in any dimension that exists. Your senses would be so grand and so great you would know of things in great distances as though they were happening all at once around you and you would be able to separate anything no matter where it was, and even hold an image of it. The creative source is that way. Everything that you can imagine, which is God, is bigger than you can imagine. And you were there. We only have the word you. And I'm not talking about the human you. 
And you know that. You are part of me. I am part of you. This is the hardest thing we will ever teach. We'll continue to teach it. The linear mind doesn't understand it. And that is also on purpose. If you could see who you were, you wouldn't stick around being who you are. <laughs> it's hidden from you. Some of the teaching in the new energy is an expansive consciousness where you are seeing more of who you are. And in that expansive consciousness, it's not just about discovery of a new biology or new inventions. It's a realization of the who when it comes to that which is in you. Imbued in every piece, every molecule of DNA imbued in there is the creator. It's in a way you cannot itemize and you cannot count it. And neither can you count souls on the planet because they're not singular. The soup which is God becomes your soul. And this is the hard part. And before I'm done today, if you think this is confusing, just wait. <laughs> because what I have to reveal is not something that you can cognize easily. And it's not something that you are really ready to understand fully. But I want to tell you, even in your confusing, even in your confusion, I want you to see the grandness of what is here. The grand thing is that you are part of the creative source. When the restraints of humanism are lifted from you, dear human being, you are God. And you are not a part of God. You are God. Because the soup of God does not compartmentalize itself and slip into human bodies with names and personalities. And that is what I want to tell you. Number one, the souls that are in you are not singular. They are part of the whole. That's easy to say, but hard to grasp. When you look at another human being and you give them the honoring of greeting the God inside, which you have often said namaste, you greet the God in them that is the God in you. Did you ever think they're the same soul? No. You have your soul, they have theirs. That's what you think. And it's the best you can do. Because if you combine them together, there are problems with your mind. The mind that is linear and wants your soul to be yours alone will keep you from understanding this message. And what I'm going to tell you is that when you cross the bridge of understanding, you'll understand that it amplifies things. It does not change them and subtract in their magnificence. There is no such thing as a singular soul. It is always connected to the whole. The soup of God is always in a soup. You might call it a collective if you wish. And it does not separate itself. Pieces and parts of it, if you wish to call it that, inhabit the human body and consciousness. And you identify it as your soul. My partner's teaching this year will be about the nine attributes of the human being, and three of those are the soul group. And he talks about the core. And that is what you feel when you get into a deep meditative state. You touch the core, and you think it's you. It isn't. It's everybody. And that's why it is so magnificent. I don't want you to think this is a foreign entity inside you. It is you. But you are God. The only linear thing is that humans live in 3D and never see the connection. 
And here's what it means. Now, my partner, we're going to be more succinct this time than we were last, and we will not break out into other teachings as we did before. I'm speaking to my partner who sits in the chair about what is coming that might be different than what was given before. I'm going to break some paradigms that you've been taught. The human soul is creator. It does not belong to humans. It is part of creation that is in you. Therefore, there is no such thing as a soul in a learning capacity. Souls don't learn. Humans do. And yet you are told sometimes that they are specific groups of souls and that some are more, what you'd say, wise than others. My partner uses the word old soul. You're all old. <laughs> it's just that some of you have been humans longer than others. Old soul doesn't even make sense because there is no time of a soul. Always was, always will be part of God. And then that is not a correct label, old soul. But humans will continue to use it because it means something different than what it is. There's no such thing as souls that are in a learning capacity to be better souls, going to some place else where they would be graduate souls. This is all in the purview of the mind of the human being who is attached to human things. Humans learn. Humans graduate. Human moves from one level to another. Souls do not, dear one. And so get used to this. What if I told you? <laughs> Your soul is identical in its magnificence to every soul on this planet. What's the worst human being you could think of? In history, alive now, worst one has the same soul you do. And what should that tell you about free choice? It tells you that this specific, magnificent piece of God is available at full strength, really, to any human by free choice who wishes to look there. We gave you a channel once before that said what the rules were of spirit was that we cannot intervene with free choice. We can watch you make the mistakes. We can watch you turn your back upon what is inside you that's magnificent. We can watch you develop evil. And we can't do anything. It has to be you. It has to be that which is human that makes the choice. Those who have been humans longer on this planet make better choices because they are aware of the God inside at some level. That's just one attribute that I want to I demystify how this works. This one is similar. There is no advancement of souls. You should know this. There is this feeling that human beings have that you start as an animal and graduate to a human. And that somehow the soul goes through certain incarnations where it is a lesser human being or perhaps in an animal in order to, to graduate to an old soul. Any of these things, you just name them, they're all around. That's what humans do. They make levels of advancement and importance. And they place them upon God and even teach them. That diminishes the creative source. Crying, you mean the animals don't have souls? I didn't say that. They have a different kind of what you call soul, and yes, it reincarnates, and we have told you that before, but it never crosses the barrier of animal to human, ever. It's precious and it's sacred what is inside you, human being. It belongs to your DNA and it's part of a plan. It didn't start as an animal. There are those who actually think that 
The smaller the animal, the lower the soul. You start as a hamster, you become a dolphin someday, and then you're a human. By the way, that's taught in places. <laughs> I want to tell you, that's not the way of it at all. It just isn't. And so there is no learning. There is no levels of advancement. And there's no hierarchy. Wait a minute, crying. What about archangels and lesser angels? We've given that discussion before. It's only in your thinking where you put them and what you name them. That is a human attribute. It is not God. There's no management system or flow charts with God. There is no hierarchy of who is in charge of whom or what with God. It is a system that is known by all. It is beautiful and it is sacred and it is perfect. There are those scientists who have looked out into the universe and they're starting to realize it could not have been made by accident. And they are struggling with this because it is outside of the reality they have of evolution being chance. Well, it isn't. It's designed. And if you want to know why this galaxy was designed the way it is, I will tell you. It's so you could sit on this earth and hear these words. It's all about you. It really is. Everything revolves around the human being on this planet. And the animals know it at, love, at some levels. They all know it. Getting you to realize it has been slow. And now that is the task, is it not? To understand that the system supports you. You are not bucking the system. When you go outside and you look at the things you don't think you can control, the things that happen to you, the weather and all the things that you say you're just bounced around from place to place. All of them are invitations for you to change. Perhaps you know humans who have had very unfortunate lives and everything bad has happened to them at every single juncture. Dear human being, that particular human had a grand opportunity to be brought to zero and take the hand of God. And instead of turning their backs, to actually enhance their lives and understand. And they either did or they didn't. And this is the free choice. To some of you, you look at life and say, well, it doesn't make sense to me because it seems cruel or, or this or that has happened to them or me. Not understanding. These have all been synchronistic turning point possibilities and potentials. And some will wallow in the grief of them and some will take the hand of God and move forward. That are decision points we give humanity over and over. And it's not always through grief. Sometimes it's through joy and celebration. Depends upon who you are, where you've been. Old soul, you see, even I will use the word. Your soul is forever. It's unchangeable. It's perfect. It's beautiful. What do you call it? Your higher self. That's a, good, that's a good one. That is the self that vibrates higher than you do. The part of God. But you still want it to have your name, don't you? Did you know that the soul has no personality? <laughs> There's no attributes of humanism at all in the soul. Oh, if I could really give you the picture. I would love you to see it. The perfection of the universe that you share with every other human being on the planet. Do you know what increased human consciousness really is? It's building the bridge to connectivity. 
when you start to understand that really you're all the same. My partner has spoken about the evolution of religion on the planet Earth. And the thing that to expect that we have asked you again to look for is how religion, organized religion, will shift. The, the, the question has arisen, will it survive? And the answer is yes. We have told you before, it doesn't matter how humans find God. It really doesn't matter. And there will be levels of human knowledge because of the levels of human understanding about who God is. Therefore, it's important that all of the processes remain so that the human beings just starting out can go through whatever process they wish to and have their hands held while they do it by a master. So what about organized religion and how is it going to change? It's going to start seeing connectivity. And this is what we teach. There's going to be an understanding and a revelation, perhaps even a return to the original teachings that they will then look at, which honors all the other belief systems. When the religions of this planet join together and realize they are unique and they are okay, to worship the way they wish to and at the same time acknowledge the other's rights to worship the way they want to, you will see an expansion on this planet of spiritual work and knowledge and understanding and compassion. But as long as they separate into groups that say, we know how to worship the one God better than you know how to worship the one God, you're in trouble. And you knew that, didn't you? That's, religion is not going to diminish or go away. It's going to get bigger. Especially when it is one that is what I will call compassionate to all the others. Isn't it interesting on your planet there is a full realization of a monotheistic God. One God. And most of the earth believe even in the afterlife. And yet you segment yourself into thousands of pieces deciding who is right to worship the one God. That is what will change. It's about connectivity. And what I'm about to give you will challenge your perception of connectivity. <laughs> we bring up the subject next and finally about soul sharing. You're not going to like this, dear one because it breaks the paradigm of your traditional thought. We'll start easy. We'll start simple, and then we'll get hard. Soul sharing. Have you heard of a walk-in? All right. Let's talk about what it is, what you think it is, what you're taught it is, the problems of logic and singularity that exist. Here is what you're often told. A human being will pass and come back. But in order to come back quickly and move over the growing up period in order to accomplish things quicker, they will soul share at approximately the age of 8 to 13 with another soul that is grown up already. That's the walk-in. And so now you have two souls, supposedly, in one body. Follow me so far. So now the walk-in has an attribute that you have to ask about, and many have. All right, what happens to the first soul? Does it take a subservient position? If the name is Sally and the second soul comes in, and that was Henry, it's confusing. What does Henry think about it, being in another gender with Sally? Can they exist together? Does one take a back seat? Does one go forward? Does one simply give up and go back? <laughs> what is the process of this? And human beings that are esoteric wring their hands and have discussions and say, how can this be? And what do we make of it? And we sit by and we look at it and we go, what are you talking about? You have a 3D argument going on, and all of the machinations of your logic puzzles 
have been created by you. Because Henry and Sally are just fine with it all. You see, what you don't know and what you haven't figured out, there aren't two souls in that body. There's just one called God. The Henry and the Sally, ah, uh, that's what you made of it. One soul joining another and soul sharing is like God with God. It's you with you. You just got bigger. There will be arguments. Well, what attributes of the Akash belong to Sally? And what attributes of the Akash belong to Henry? What if I told you they combined them? What if I told you things just got bigger with the walk-in? Would that be all right? What if I told you the whole purpose of the walk-in is combined Akash? So that the experiences of many lifetimes, apart from what you think is singular in your past lives, can combine into another human being as one. Now that's confusing. You see, it's bigger than you think. There are no puzzles to figure out with the majesty of God. A walk-in, it's very common, especially with an old soul passing and coming back quickly into one who has already grown. It is a system of benevolence, of understanding, a fast-tracking system that allows things to happen better than they would have other word, otherwise and taking less times. And by the way, it's often in a family. Hmm. Now, this is going to get worse if you're confused already. The next subject, soulmates. It's not what you think. One person meets another person, and they have a connection. And it doesn't matter. It's outside of romance, although that's there too, to really confuse things. It may be a past life as a brother, sister, mother, dad, but they know. They know the person. They think like the person. They can have conversations and look in each other's eyes and just being amazed. They must have spent lifetimes together in order to have this similarity of thought and thinking of ideas, passions. There's an attraction to be with that person. Just stay with that person because they represent something that is so special and you call it Soulmate, let me tell you, what if I told you you just met yourself? I told you it gets spooky. What if soul sharing is something where you met a piece of yourself in another human being? And if I told you that, we walk out of the room <laughs> and say, this is not for me, this can't be for me. I want to tell you, I want you to use your discernment. If God is not singular and you are a piece of the whole and everybody is in you and you are in everybody else, why is that so spooky? That you would see a piece of yourself in another human being because that's the way soul sharing works. It's hard to describe because you want to singularize it. Instead of seeing the glory of God in that person, you're seeing you in them because you have been together in one human body in the past. That's what a soulmate is. No wonder you're attracted to them. And they're attracted to you. Soul sharing cannot be explained satisfactorily to any single digit dimensional human being. And everything that I'm doing now will simply complicate it. <laughs> Let me tell you the most complicated one. And then I want to give you an example. And after that, we'll close. I have told you that there is a system of reincarnation that honors the family. And that, that at the very least, the system has one generation skipped for reincarnation within a family. Most of the time, it's two generations, but often it's every other generation. And this allows for new souls coming in to learn 
and for old souls to be their children and their parents, if you see what I'm saying, and vice versa. It mixes it up, and it's helpful for both. For instance, old soul, your children are probably not, but your grandchildren are. You see where this is going? Skipping every other generation. And you know this is true. For in, in, in a generality, we will say, you know your children best, but when your grandchildren came in, you saw something in them that you recognized. Now, I want to make this so clear, and I cannot. This is very, very understandable to you, and it's fine as long as the grandparents are dead. But if they're alive, now there's a problem. Because I've just told you that your grandchildren could be you. What do you think of that? <laughs> you look in their eyes and you know what's in there, don't you? There's a connection and they're on to you. They know that you're going to give them everything they want. <laughs> because they are you and you are them. The peace of God you have shared is not a singular soul with your name on it or their name on it. Pieces of you are in them. And it's not just chemistry. We'll talk about that tomorrow night. To complicate all of this, I'll talk about inheritance that is different between Akashic and chemical. Really, to mix it all up. So who are you? <laughs> who are you? Is it possible? The more you get to know each other, the more you see the same God in all of you. The connectivity is what solves the problems of human variety, of you not getting along. There'll come a day, dear ones, if you follow the same progressions of those before you on other planets who have gone through this before, there'll come a time when you acknowledge the similar God in all of you first. And then the personality differences second. This is a secret to peace on earth. Looking at the other one and knowing their desires are the same as yours. That it's compassion. Not trickery. It's generosity and not bullying. And you start to look at what creates what it creates in personalities differently and aside from the God inside. You'll see their, their degree of awakening and help them to do what you've done through what you can show them in your graciousness and in your maturity in how you live. That's the only vehicle of teaching other human beings about God that we have to give you. Let me give you a, a little story and then we close. I want to talk about Evelyn, the everlasting tree. <laughs> you know, parables don't make a lot of sense. Because they are allegories, you have to forgive some of the 3D parts. And so Evelyn doesn't really exist in nature in the same way. But it's a story. And it's close enough to what nature does so that you will understand. Evelyn. Evelyn had an essence about her as a tree. The essence of Gaia was there. And she knew she was Evelyn. She had the consciousness of a grand plant that she was. Her purpose, her sole purpose was to grow as much as she could and to give oxygen to the planet for humanity. Evelyn put down roots, as trees do as they grow, and she could feel her roots go down, and they would then absorb those things which she needed for her growth. The resources of the dirt of the earth were in her roots, and she grew taller. 
As she grew taller, her roots then spread out more in order to anchor the size that she was and the majesty she represented in her forest. Now, Evelyn wasn't really aware of all of the roots. There were so many of them over time. But one in particular found its way back to the surface, a great distance from her, many meters, and sprouted. And this sprout then became a tree. And this, 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 this little sprout started growing, just like Evelyn had, and it had a name, Martha. <laughs> now here is Evelyn watching Martha grow up. Martha grew from Evelyn's root. Now Martha, over a period of time, put down some roots, and the same thing happened with her. In the same time, Evelyn had other sprouts going on in the other direction. They were Evelyn's roots sprouting as other trees with other names. You see where I'm going with this? Eventually we have a forest and all the roots are connected. They're all connected. The life force of the nutrients of the planet are surging through all of them. There is no beginning or end of any root. They're all connected to each other. Now, I want to interview Evelyn. Evelyn, who are you? As you look around the forest, are you Evelyn? Or are you also Martha and George, Sally? Who are you? And Evelyn would have to stand tall and say, I am all of them, and they are all of me. Because our roots are combined together from the same source. I want you to look at that. And I want you to understand that it is the metaphor of who you are. In nature, you look at these kinds of things and you, ha you say, how unique. You don't see it as you do yourselves with, with individual personalities, and lives to live, or you walk around. But it's true. Connectivity and the realization of it and the oneness that is all is going to be the salvation of humanity. But it has to, it has to start, literally start, with you understanding that the soul inside you is bigger than anything you ever thought. Now, I told you in a moment ago the soul has no personality. Not like you think. But it does have an attribute. It has perfection, love, benevolence. That's what you feel. The hand of the soul, which is God, is always open to you. Always. From the moment you're born, the invitation is to discover who you are, to take that hand and move into a position where you can change the planet. And old soul, you've lived long enough to come to this point and hear this message. Well, you know I'm right. Because this is the time to take that hand. It's got to be with your free choice, with your intent, and with your understanding. That's what I want to do. Don't do anything because you should. Or because you came to a meeting and heard a channel that may have moved you. Now you, you should do something. Don't do that. I want you to sit by yourself alone in a chair and ask your body, is there more? And it will shiver in response. And the first thing it's going to say is, what took you so long to ask? And it'll say, yes. And that is the beginning of discovery. My partner did that. He did it 23 years ago. He started with himself. He was afraid. What energy is talking through me? How could it do this? Is it the devil? All of the things that linear minds go through, through tradition and training and misinformation, was there. All of it. Until he got to a place of pure emotion, where he wept with the understanding that he was more than he thought. And it led him right to the source. 
That's the invitation, dear one, of every single human being on the planet. If you relax and talk to that which is your innate in your body and let it help guide you to the truth, you'll get it. Don't listen to me. Don't listen to another human being. I want you to start listening to you. Start asking yourselves and yourselves what it is you need to know. And it'll tell you. Is this channeling real or is it not? Use your discretion and your discernment and your, all the words you want. <laughs> Discern the energy of the day. My partner steps aside for this and now he comes back in a moment. All this time to give you a message of love coming from that source, which is you. You ought to recognize this voice, not the human voice, the other one that's been talking to you in the third language all this time, whispering, listen, listen, listen. This is what you came for. It really is. Dear old soul, you are the hope of the planet. Whoever is listening to this, 